Welcome to a new episode of our podcast called Access to Perspectives Conversation. My name is Jo Havemann and I'm very glad to be joined today by Özgün Ünver. And um, yeah, welcome Özgün. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody, um, Özgün has her own business, which is called Mind Your Own, not business, but revision. So again, your business is called Mind Your Own Revisions. And um, so for a starting point to get us into the conversation, could you tell us a bit about your background and what you're, yeah, what else you're working with? We exchanged a bit before this recording and what made you think you wanted to start your own business? Yeah, thank you. Wow, from the first moment going into the deep conversation <laughs> thank you for the question <laughs> so i um i used to be a social scientist um i studied many many disciplines under social sciences I studied international relations social cultural anthropology statistics social policy education policy all of those things and um I finished my PhD several uh, years ago. And towards the end of my PhD, um, while I was also at the same time working as a research associate at a, at a research institute, I had my burnout. Aye, aye, aye. So the, the way I say this, I, I, I usually say oh, I had my burnout at that time. But it is a process, of course. It's just mm. the, the whole thing came to a, a more dramatic mm. <laughs> point at that time. And that, that's uh, those few weeks, I call them my my um, lowest point. Mm. Um, and uh, recovering from that has been a journey it's still a journey i uh, still consider myself recovering from burnout because it's mm -hmm. the way that kind of thing affects your body your mind your your nervous system it's it's not something you can undo just mm -hmm. like that um but yeah the, recovering from that but starting from the denial phase at first I had to learn so much, both about myself, about academia, mm -hmm. about this Western society that I'm living in, and and the, the so-called work ethics there, the 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 things that are expected of me, and and all of those things. So it has been a journey and. Um, I want to basically share this, uh, what I learned mm -hmm. with others to help them at least prevent burnout if possible. But if they're already in there, help them get out of it. Right. So I got certified as a stress and burnout coach as well. Um, and in the meantime, I left academia myself after some coaching getting co a lot of coaching myself I realized that that wasn't my calling not anymore hmm. so I changed careers but added added more actually I became both a data steward at university and started uh, my coaching practice on the then, on the side but then you didn't really leave academia you just shifted gears and you changed the the seat on the table um, hmm. I wouldn't okay. really say that. I wouldn't really say that. I left the academic so-called yeah. rat race, if you could call it that. Mm. I totally left that. Yeah. So All I am right. still at the university. I am serving mm. academics mm. in both in uh, both jobs that I have, let's say. Mm -hmm. But in one of them, as data steward, uh, rather an administrative mm. work. It is nine to five and I'm out. 
and that uh, it's uh, much easier to keep that that boundary but it doesn't mean that oh everybody who has burnout as an academic should leave academia or yeah just get the hell out of here <laughs> so there there are people who who give that message a lot oh yeah i left academia it's terrible everybody should leave it too that's not my approach because yeah, yeah i we are all different. What we want in life is different. And as long as you are happy and you can keep your well-being in uh, all aspects, why not? Yeah, I agree. Also, just to the listeners, um, mental well-being or overall well-being for researchers and within academia is a recurring theme on the show. <laughs> We've had a few episodes in the past and we would likely have more in the future also um, touching on how we can maintain or re reestablish uh, mental equilibrium or balance. One second. Um, so basically, yeah, that's, that's just what I wanted to throw in. So it's, it's probably also many who are listening to us now who can relate and feel a bit stressed at work and think, oh, is it just me or is it also other people? And like, it's it's probably also people in your department. And what I've learned from myself, I've also had my, my coming out in a way, like on this show a couple of episodes ago. <laughs> and, um, so to actually put it in, in in public and and speak openly about yes I had depression and it was enforced certainly by by the pressure at work. So when you say so basically what you're saying is that there is a way within academia and within an, an academic career trajectory to set your personal boundaries to establish an an almost nine to five job situation. And it's probably not nine to five because different um, disciplines require different time commitments. But it's, it's really about bounding, boundary setting, right? To know your limits and to be tr stay true to yourself and to allow ourselves to see recreational phases and off times and holidays as part of work to be able to regain energy so that we can work well basically and not not only for efficiency purposes but also to feel good as we work exactly and healthy exactly so uh, efficiency productivity those are those are concepts that we talk about way too much but we don't talk about where they come from mm -hmm. someone can seem to be uh, productive and efficient and yeah but that, that could be really driven from a very big un unrest like this stress that's, that's happening inside of us and the outer world may not know it but we are basically consuming ourselves mm -hmm. while doing that and sooner or later we might end up in burnout like that um but the the question is whether you can keep that sustainable you can be productive sustainably mm -hmm. and not out of fear but out of yeah i want to do this like out of uh really authentically wanting to do something mm -hmm. so the result may be the same but where it comes from that will change a lot of things and that's that's what we don't really talk about much yeah. and when we say boundary also like you said uh, many people think oh yeah it should be nine to one and i should say no to everybody you know when <laughs> we talk about boundaries it's usually mm. in that sense but boundaries are more than that you don't have to say no to everybody and you know like you know i have boundaries from now on no to everything <laughs> But it is, it basically starts with the boundaries with yourself, knowing yourself, knowing what you 
want, what you can do, what you can't do, and what your limitations are, knowing that and mm-hmm. like starting from that point. Um, and this nine to five thing, it, I like it, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that everybody likes it. Mm-hmm. I am married to a researcher mm-hmm. and that person is not working nine to five. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's totally okay for, for us both mm-hmm. because we make sure that he's um, doing well in like all aspects of well-being if we can call it that Mm -hmm. and if it becomes too much it is not because you you worked until six o'clock in the evening that you will have a burnout well it it depends on other things it depends on Mm -hmm. basically your, your mindset first and foremost and where does that mindset come from society academia your childhood even your education um and on top of that what are the expectations of the society from you Mm. uh what are the expectations of academia from you all these unwritten rules you are supposed to do that and that and that on paper but actually unless you do those other 20 things you will never get anywhere this this whole mind game that's really exhausting Mm -hmm. yeah and it feels like academia as i signed up for it it sounded so much fun because you think as a researcher you can really pursue what you're actually interested in and explore and follow your childlike curiosity and do that for a living and then you are in the system and you feel oh it's actually only about publishing and getting that paper out and then another one and where is the purpose and like and that's what i'm trying to achieve with the work that i do to bring joy back to the research workflow through open science practices through cooperative and collaborative research approaches by being as open as feasible and doesn't mean that everything has to be openly and disclosed, openly discussed or published um, as close as necessary, as the mantra goes in, in the open science community. Yeah, and so tell us about what's what's behind the name of your of your company, Mind Your Own Revisions. Obviously, ah, yeah. it reminds us of Mind Your Own Business, say away, that's my boundary. But and revisions, now okay, we 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 realize there's a connection to probably scientific writing so what's what how what made you come up with that name <laughs> well i i started my podcast um when was that three years ago three years ago and uh, i was trying to basically find a find a name for it i hadn't started my coaching practice back then but uh, i just wanted to talk about Basically, mental health in academia, burnout in academia, mental well-being in general, and this this certain type of stress we academics are under uh, a lot of the time. So I was basically looking for a podcast name that was a bit cheeky, and then uh, yeah, why not? I said that 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 sounds close enough, and then. I decided to keep that for for the website and for the coaching right. uh, practice and all of that. Yeah, I, I kind of like that it is specific for academics. That, yeah. uh, it's funny because we're also in the midst of um, redefining what peer review is. And it sounds like a little bit of calling for a revolution like oh revisions fine mind your own one like i i can i know how to revise or not my my manuscript mind your own revisions <laughs> it brings up <laughs> that, a lot of thoughts that yeah. too actually yeah the, the the way you say it um the point of those words coming together in that way was like we we get so much criticism in academia as academics, as researchers. It's like our work is criticized like into pieces. Mm. And for some of us that 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 line gets blurred. Like where does where does our work 
stop getting criticized and ourselves as, as human beings start mm -hmm. getting criticized. And for many of us, unfortunately, this is a problem. And like there we we are like constantly trying to quote unquote prove ourselves. I show that we can be better and do better and uh, get more projects and write more and this and that. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. we are constantly bombarded with, I had more, you need to revise yourself mm -hmm. and the way you do things. And it's like, it was also a bit of like, <laughs> stop telling me what to do. Like you mind your own revisions. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, it's actually sad um, as you say that because it's true, like many of us define ourselves over what we do and not who we are. We, oh yeah, as we define ourselves over what we do and not appreciate who we are and be able, setting another boundary, like that's the work. And if other people now revise and give their input, it's not nothing personal. It's not a personal attack, but we often take it as it. And that also like probably has to do with personal growth, which... Yeah, people like us can help young researchers to get better at it for their own sake. And yeah, that that's that's true, like you said. And it's also a bit like the people who end up in academia, you know, the way when we are growing up, we always hear these words. I won't generalize, but many of us can relate to this, I think. Ah, oh, you're very smart. Oh, school is so easy for you. Wow, well done. You're you're like really good. You're doing really well. And like you you do well academically, you do well at school, you do well in that environment, uh, for some of us at least. Uh, and then you progress and progress. Okay, you finish university. I I want to go further. I'm super smart <laughs> and all these degrees later, PhD as well. And at that level, we meet a lot of people who are very smart and we are not the smartest one in the room anymore <laughs> so this part is not talked about that much but yeah. i do believe that that has a bit of an effect like um i have yeah, to like... admit though i was never an a student in school so i'm not i i know i know these people i've seen a lot at um, the first year in university i wasn't one of them i was always a middle middle person sandwich kid <laughs> Maybe I was also middle, but I I did get that that message of ah oh, yeah, Özgün yeah, yeah. is very smart in other yeah. ways. Yeah, I, no, I didn't yeah, I heard it like... a lot from friends like oh you're studying, oh you're doing a PhD. It's like yeah, but it's just actually it's because I don't know what else to do, and this is what you do as a <laughs> biologist. So I'm oh. just stuck here. <laughs> so mind your own revision. So how so what are you doing? Like who are you working with? Who's working with you? And what can you do for these researchers, I suppose? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I usually work with researchers at any level of seniority who have problems with stress management mostly, mm. who are suspecting that they could be burnt out and uh, that they are looking for some way out some people don't come to me with the like very clear ah oh, yeah i'm i'm super stressed and i don't know how to manage this uh message but they come from like i ha i have this huge imposter syndrome that i, I like it freezes me i can't do anything uh some others come with like self doubt which is very similar I'm, like i'm constantly doubting um like what I am doing here and whether I am doing enough. Some mm. of them come with the problems like, oh, I just, I can't work. I keep procrastinating. Like I have this project and that's my deadline. It's just this much time has passed and I haven't done anything. But basically many of these things can be addressed uh with with coaching and stress and burnout coaching is uh, a very good one of these because all of them have some root in in the bad 
stress management, but with that, I don't want to sound like I'm putting the blame on the person. Ah, yeah, you're managing your stress badly. Mm. It's just not effective. Mm. The in all of these cases, we need to undo, untie all of the years of um, years of conditioning around. Ah, yeah, what is what is work ethic actually? What is procrastination? What is work? What is not work? Mm-hmm. All of these things. And then start from scratch, like with a uh, very clear understanding of what is going on. Meanwhile, if a person is really like in the technically in burnout, mm-hmm. Uh, and I am not the judge of that. They usually need to go to their uh, general practitioner and get diagnosed uh, by that person in countries where this diagnosis mm. is possible to get. Mm. Um, and we we work further on on uh, basically recovery because before you start talking about um like on conditioning yourself you need to be at a certain baseline level of functioning yeah that that all depends from one person to the other so mm-hmm. it's a uh, very personal coaching and uh, really depending on your needs in that moment that's what we're going to work on so some people are not that deep in that in that like burnout situation. So we can um, let's say quicker turn things around. Mm. But with the others, it can take longer because you need to recover first to a baseline level. Mm. Um, and yeah, mostly people approach me with these kind of questions, and also because I almost exclusively work with academics, not only with them. I don't turn anyone else down, like, oh, yeah, you can't uh, get coaching from me because you're not an academic. Mm. Um, my understanding of academia helps helps the researchers. Uh, yeah, research. for sure. It's, I think it helps a lot when you know the system people are in and the pressure points they have. So that they don't exactly. have to explain so much. Exactly. And I can imagine how they are thinking when, when they say, ah, yeah, but uh, I just needed to work uh, like 18 hours a day last week because I had a deadline. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's coming from another um, sector. It would be a bit difficult to mm-hmm. understand. Like, how would you do that? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So I don't I have I have a lot of thoughts on on what you just said. So I'm trying to organize them. So would you say it has to do a lot with time management? So so that you help people to gain grounds again by structuring their day in a way that's healthier yes, yes. and that they certainly can... sorry i i interrupted no, 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 go no. ahead I just, I just wanted to add like um that they feel um a sense of accomplishment mm-hmm. by helping them mm-hmm. to actually measure the success per day this is what i've learned in you know in my therapy se- sessions like to to have a success diary um where you basically just take note of what were the good things that happened today what were my accomplishments and if it's at times it's getting out of bed that like that's when it's really bad <laughs> um but then from there there's quick recovery and then you can easily also see how things are getting better without overdoing again so that's then yeah yeah well certainly time management is a part of it certainly it is it's very important but more important than time management is energy management oh okay so um of course that that definitely comes into picture at some point um 
dealing with certain kind of issues like oh procrastination or i'm not able to start doing this thing or oh my god my project is too big i don't know where to begin mm -hmm. of course um chopping that up to the small pieces and like go for very short uh, tasks and just complete them in a day that certainly helps giving this boost of oh, yeah, i i did something that dopamine right boost and there is this energy management aspect of it that mm -hmm. many people don't know about, unfortunately. Um, one of the downsides of looking at this whole thing from the perspective of only time management and saying, okay, I will write an email. Writing that email, it will take me, mm -hmm. let's say, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever, to, to my supervisor. Right. But the, the energy that that writing that email will take from you might be much bigger or much smaller. You may need a, a certain amount of energy to do a certain task and I may need a, a, another amount of energy to, to spend mm -hmm. on it to have that task done. Um, you may be like very good at reading and like you can read five articles a day or 10 or whatever. But yeah, with me, it could be one, may barely. Mm -hmm. So all of these things need to be taken into account. It is not like you're a robot, that you're a machine and <laughs> that's the that's the task. And it's usually on average take this much time and then boom, you have it. It's mm -hmm. more like, wait, how much energy did that take you? Mm -hmm. It also depends on your relationships with people. Like, again, from this example of, uh, let's say, a PhD researcher emailing their supervisor. Depending on your relationship with that person, that could be a, a very chill. Ah, yeah, it's like we have. A very good relationship that person is supportive and it's just i'm just letting them know about certain mm -hmm. thing from five minutes or oh my god i'm gonna be scolded i'm gonna be criticized that's expectation and then mm -hmm. so yeah there is a there are a lot of nuances there right yeah no i actually haven't seen i think it was somehow present but i never mentioned the energy level how much influence it actually has and how efficient, again, that word, we can be with certain tasks in our workflow. And yeah, so yeah. writing a paper, like nobody can say, oh, it just takes a week or it takes half a year. And anything in between is a reality for some people and some topics, but there is not one time that you can say it always takes to write a paper because it's exactly, hard. exactly. And it depends on where you are on, on your journey. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think it will be important to mention is that, yeah, we talk about mental health and mental well-being in academia. And we put usually burnout in, in that picture. Mm -hmm. Though we need to make this distinction um, between mental health related issues and burnout though they definitely are interconnected uh, you mentioned depression before for instance that is a um, mood disorder right there is it's a it's a disorder it's mood disorder and many mental health related problems yeah. are those kind of things as well. If I, if I well, may just intervene for a second, because um, I wouldn't call it a disorder. I just, I think it's an alarm from our body to say, hey, you need mm -hmm. to take rest. Like you, this is not healthy. We need to pull the brake. Okay. So okay. First term, like I've struggled with um, also the level of depression, this and that. But then I figured eventually also one of my practitioners said, the brain is just another organ like you know i mean you can ha have heart failures and you're not as stigmatized as you are for mental health issues oh, yeah. or, and i what i've learned and realized for myself and impression also what i've seen in others is that we are asking too much of ourselves or people around us are asking things of us that we are not good at 
and then we try so hard to comply and that's what's burning us out and that's i think what exactly and that the... that too exactly that's what i want to come actually oh, sorry, to. Yeah. burnout burnout is not a mood disorder mm. burnout is not a mental health uh issue per se it has mental health implications it is an energy disorder mm -hmm. so you basically deplete your yeah. body your body gets depleted one way or another and there isn't room for any well-being of any kind anymore mm -hmm. and that that happens in several levels it's mental but certainly physical as well mm -hmm. so um exhaustion is a big one that we, we usually talk about four categories when we talk about burnout one is exhaustion the other one is mental distance this used to be called cynicism mm -hmm. but uh, newer generation oh. researchers call it oh. mental distance because you don't see the point of your job anymore and your your work anymore and whether you are making any contribution to the world and then you have the cognitive uh impairment mm. the memory problems come in here the the issues with oh my god i read this this sentence like 10 times and i just don't get it or yeah i'm not able to like read anything anymore all the like letters are are going into each other um mm. and you also have the emotional impairment where you you cannot control your feelings anymore. You have, you lash out to people or you have crying burst or whatever. Not all these four happen at the like, same uh, level to, for everybody, but there's usually a combination of, yeah. of these four major things. Yeah. And uh, unless burnout is accompanied by a, a mental health issue uh, such as depression or something else a coach can help but if it is accompanied mm. with especially with depression because that's that's a very easy combination to see mm -hmm. and uh, also a very tricky distinction to make is this depression or is this burnout mm -hmm. but let's say you got the good diagnosis it's a bit of that a bit of that coaching on its own uh, i wouldn't recommend it and i don't find it ethical to have a client who's like clearly showing signs of depression on top of burnout then i definitely send them to a psychotherapist and yeah. a coach can as an extra help yeah but definitely there should be a medical uh, professional there too yeah no i agree and um it is like in germany it's so difficult to find a therapist and then also some of the therapies are like i've had better coaching sessions to what the therapist was able or capable of delivering it's always a very personal thing you know this is it's, it has to click on a personal level with the other person yeah and yeah um so yeah, uh, well, deep stuff. <laughs> and also, well, for both of us, also very personal stuff. Um, it's also like, it's become also a, a trend in a way, like, or it's it's somehow um, that people who have anxiety or depression, which are more likely to end up clinical and can also, by the way, be not fixed, but mitigated and sm like, uh, what's the word like you can ease the symptoms with medication in many cases um, and then once you have a certain level of stability again and um, activity back to your uh, daily activities mm -hmm. in the day, um, that's I think when a coach or a behavioral therapist can come in and, mm -hmm. and guide you back into yeah the work efficiency uh, capabilities indeed if someone is burnt out it's 
before we come to the efficiency, we are talking about survival in that moment. Yeah. Just staying alive because your body is like in a conservation mode. Mm. It's so consumed with chronic stress for such a long time that efficiency, what are we talking about? First, you need to remember to drink water and, and yeah. eat well and should be able to move your body and get get some um excitement in your life in some way like oh yeah well, what do you like to do do you like to do anything is life more than work for you already or are you still thinking that that's the only thing you do so before all of those things are tackled and this baseline comes it's very difficult yeah. to go further and indeed, once uh, once these conditions are in remission, the coaching can happen. But yeah, otherwise, therapy is always a better option. Um, yeah, that's the dif the difference between coaching and therapy. Actually, I I usually say it. It's not always mutually exclusive, and they all these like uh, very strong boundaries of each other but when people ask me uh, what what is the difference between the two i say usually okay therapy looks at your trauma looks at your past looks at why you are here how did you end up here so there's this um insight towards the past and how you end up mm. and stop where you ended up and coaching is more like, okay, where do we go from here? Like mm -hmm. towards the future. So they all go into each other's realms. Of course, we are human beings. <laughs> we can't always say, oh yeah, there, there we draw the line. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the major difference I can say. Yeah. And also one is yeah. in some countries being paid for by the health insurance that, the other yeah. one usually pay from your own pocket. Yes, but that's the other too. thing also in Germany, like finding a therapist um for your mental health condition is like sometimes you have to wait for a year or longer. And that's like particularly traumatic when you're in like in your worst condition. Whereas yeah. a coach you can easily get hold of. Um, but then again, as you said, the coach might not be the best person to address when you're in the middle of a crisis yeah uh, maybe yeah but there's there's strategies and we talked again we talked about some of these also in other episodes um and i just wanted to say like sometimes it's easier to talk about the the term burnout because it, it sounds a bit heroic oh i've worked so much and i've over delivered delivered to the extent that i am now burned out literally like i, I gave too much of myself that's how committed i am to my work it's not healthy it's not a good thing also you might be hiding um so that's what i said like i wouldn't call depression and anxiety disorders i think societies have or people are different and some people are more sensitive to some cues in life than others and we have different strengths and i think people are prone to develop mental health conditions or disorders by the book um have just been triggered too much or have been pushed or pushed themselves into workplaces and situations where we're not comfortable and being uncomfortable being a, a huge understatement in this regard so coming back to what we said in the beginning it's essential to learn about annoying our boundaries and not to exclude people from our lives, but to know our limits and to develop a healthy relationship first and foremost with ourselves. Certainly. Uh, if you if you don't think you are you are worthy of having a, a, a healthy lifestyle and a good mental health and happiness at your work. Yeah. Yeah, nobody can do that for you. But again, with the caveat here, it's not that burnout is your fault. Burnout is never your own fault. 
only your your fault like you are pushed there with a lot of elements for years and once you are there unfortunately you are expected to get out of it on your own as well mm. but there is definitely very big responsibilities for for uh, the workplaces as well and society in general beyond uh, beyond what a workplace can do the, the mm -hmm. society in general um yeah indeed like you said it's mm -hmm. it's boundaries uh, but boundaries in a very very wide sense mm. and also there's no shame in asking for help and we can also look at it in two different extreme, extreme from each other, different levels. In a sense, like just just imagine how how good we feel if somebody's seeking our expertise in the job. Like, hey, can you help me? I know that you're good at this kind of thing. And also, when we feel weak and we feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Why not ask our spouse, our partner, our colleague, hey, I need some help here. I am beyond capacity. And in order for us to get this done well, I I need support. And that's that's normal in a society, in a group of people, amongst colleagues. So just making use of the opportunity that we in most cases don't live in silos as individuals mm -hmm. we engage with other people and people want to be engaged with <laughs> so. exactly exactly and that is that's yeah something i see with a lot of people like no i can manage on my own mm -hmm. like okay great be so-called independent but there's a difference between being yeah independent in a in a positive way and in a dysfunctional way mm. where you really like start isolating yourself and sometimes it also comes from anxiety or the the, the fear of being criticized when you ask for mm. help as well because that also happens sometimes that like let's also put it out there so some of us go out and say okay i need help and we get the reaction of, ah, oh, yeah, but if you're not able to handle this, you shouldn't be in academia. Well, yeah. That's but also a reality. Before. But yeah. you you should then always come back to yourself, that, that your authentic self, going like, okay, is this, do I do I believe that? Mm. Do I believe this person when this person says that to me? Should I really do everything alone? No, oh, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. I would like to bridge if you if if you allow this to happen, because before the recording also we talked a little bit about bridging to your other profession. Yeah. Um so and we also talked about so how does data curation and stewardship come into play when it comes to uh, mental well-being and I I've learned myself firsthand like the like the the lack thereof like if unless okay let's me let me put it this way um if so so um put in a most positive sense if we manage our research data well we are less likely to end up in a mental crisis towards the end of a PhD or any research project that is um and the reality, unfortunately, is that hardly anyone, I think nowadays it's becoming more and more of a thing to have a data management plan from the onset. I didn't have that. And I think still today, the majority of the PhD students don't get that. How to manage, how to organize your data into folders, on what um, storage device, um, in what servers, at what institute. Well, usually that's a no-brainer, but um, so who needs access to the data um, and how what what is primary data what's secondary data do we have do we even have the storage space for all of that data depending on what data you collect who owns the data and who needs access i already said that so there's so many questions and then what's what happened to me and i've heard that from many of my peers 
is towards the end of your PhD, you look at your stuff, you look into your folder in your computer, it's like, oh my God, what have I done the past three or five years of my life? And now I'm about to hand in my thesis to get a PhD. It's like one of the biggest titles societies give these days. Um, so I'm supposed to be like amongst the elite of society. And this is what I, like, I totally failed. And here comes an imposter syndrome and all of that. <laughs> and usually it's good enough to, to hand in a thesis to make sense of it. And, but the crisis that comes with that and the like almost run of scenarios and the self-doubt and the, oh, if I just had done this better from the, from the start, um, and hopefully some of us learn along the way, <laughs> but so basically, so the question now back to you is, how did you get that job? Uh, or not as in how did you apply and all of that, but what brought you into the position of a data steward? Yeah. Um, well, the, 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 my starting was quite personal. It's a very egoistic journey. I said, okay, I don't want to be an academic anymore because it's so lonely. That was the main thing for me. <laughs> and I said, okay, I have to find something social where I can like concretely help people and have something to show for it in the evening. Like, I have answered some questions. I have helped someone. And um, data management is, yeah, indeed a, a funny transition to make because like you, I didn't have a data management plan. I wasn't good at data management during my PhD. It was a mess. Mm. But nobody ever told me that it could be otherwise. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever talked about this. This wasn't a thing when I was doing my PhD. And uh, like you said, when you are close to finishing, of course this happens. But every time I wrote an article, this happened too. Like, oh my God, where's this data? Which which version of data am I using now? What am I analyzing? Am I analyzing like underscore final, underscore final, final, or the one with another one? Like, what what is this? And like you said, that's that's a big issue. But now worse than what we went through you and i now the society is asking for okay like the return on their investment with all this publicly uh funded research yeah where are the where is the data can we use it how did you get to your results can i check can i verify it did, did you do the correct analysis did you like uh, fabricate everything those things also happen eh? you you know all these academic scandals that happen every every once in a while so it's uh now even more important to be prepared and mm -hmm. to have your data already like formatted and and imagining that yeah tomorrow someone can come in the door and say oh, yeah sure show me the data i have to i have to see it and they should be able to understand what you were doing mm -hmm. and something that many people don't consider at all is that you your future self in five years should be able to go back and understand the data as well which is yeah. not possible right. anymore right even during a, a phd the 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 things you wrote or or the, your notes from your first year sometimes not understandable to you like further down the line like what what For is me, there even a week later let's say two days later I was like what did I do and sometimes I would say oh exactly. yeah I'll document this tomorrow morning because I don't have the headspace now I want to go home because it's been already yeah, exactly hours. it's like tomorrow I'd forgotten like oh no I'm still not documenting because I can't remember what I did let <laughs> so me just move on exactly. Oh. And that's that's the thing. Like many many researchers think that this is oh another administrative task that's being pushed on me. Like oh, I have to write a data management plan. Writing that data management plan is one of the best things that you can do in your first year oh. of your research. So that yeah, when you look back, the the hard decisions are already made. Either mm -hmm. they're already made, the difficult decisions, or 
at least you you made some progress in, in making those decisions. Right. Imagine you never talk about, think about these things. Mm-hmm. And then, like you said, at the end of the PhD, oh my God, what, what do I do? Or um, your funder says, okay, now you have to share the, the data mm-hmm. with the taxpayers, with open access. Oh my God, what am I going to do then? Mm. So there can be a lot of drama there and that is totally unnecessary. Right. So unnecessary, that drama. Mm. And, you know, like psychological research also shows us that tidy spaces uh, help us have a tidy mind as well. Mm. And keeping your data tidy is also very, very important. Liberating. So yeah. it is it is liberating because you don't have to keep all of that in the corner of your mind. You can just document everything in a in an understandable way and then move on. And once you need that information, you know where it is. Uh, so when I started uh doing this uh job like my my other profession mm-hmm. uh being data steward the field was also new to me but i was thinking oh yeah this, this sounds very interesting something i didn't do during my phd but <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. let's let's see how i can do this and over time i really grew to like it as well because it is also serving researchers in another way mm. so b- both of the jobs i do they're they're about serving researchers helping them with their problems mm. uh be it about data or about their um, stress levels or whatever mm. and to anyone who is listening to this podcast who's thinking of a career transition you know, out of um, academic research or yeah, considering um, this kind of work, it is an up and coming field because the days where you like uh, bury your data somewhere are are gone. Mm. You can't do that anymore, and luckily we can't do that anymore because that's a huge waste. Yeah. So it's an expanding field, a professional uh, field as well, just like open science it's just a little part of it let's say mm-hmm. uh, via via part of it mm-hmm. um, many people talk about open data for instance oh i'm gonna share my data openly mm-hmm. and i ask them do you manage your data properly because if you don't manage your data properly please don't share, you share yeah don't don't share it because <laughs> even if you share the data mm-hmm. the, it won't be of help to anybody right it's just it, it will be a sense. mess right <laughs> yeah so and yeah many people don't don't put them together like mm-hmm. i yeah, i have to do the management part to be able to contribute to science in the way that i want yeah that's yeah that's an important for the change part. you want to bring to the discipline and the society or whatever the goal is with What's exactly the, what's the big why which like why are we collecting data for this mm-hmm. purpose for well for this topic and to eventually being able to contribute to a challenge in society or to a- acquire knowledge in a field that we are interested in because and that's yeah that's that's what many researchers tend to forget over the years and at the time especially when you write a paper you you that's an opportunity to come back to the why question again but in the daily routines it's so easy to to forget the why and the purpose the why are we getting out of bed why are we collecting the data and once you know the why again it's also easier to keep the data tidy because you know what it's good for <laughs> and, and yes it's needed to be tidy to to serve its purpose Yes, indeed. Uh, so be, before, 10 years ago, maybe we would think, oh, yeah, da- data are just means for me to mm. get to the end, that, that published article or whatever. Mm. But clean, tidy, reusable data 
That's the reason. Our, uh, end of itself, uh. in fact. And now it is more and more seen like that. And that uh, just makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because it, it can be shared. It, if someone else uses your data, yeah, you will be cited as the one who collected it and put it out there and all of that, of course, if you want to, unless you do CC0 and then <laughs> just give it away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are so many opportunities and uh, it is hopefully going to be uh, become a part of research assessment more and more over time. Right. So without going into too much detail, but the data management plan sounds big. And those of us who've seen some know that they can be big and not so big. But from your experience, what are the three, and there's probably more, but what are three must-have components in a data management plan? Well, there's for sure more. But what are like if you should if you if someone's asking you, give me three three components of what I should put on the plan, which which ones come up first for you? Oh, yeah. Well, indeed, there are so many, but I will just tell you the, the first three things that came mm -hmm. to my mind. First of all, people tend to, people being researchers, academics that right. write the, the DMPs, mm -hmm. they tend to not take very seriously the, the question about data types, what are your data actually like what 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 are you doing mm. and uh, i i see as a data steward i see a lot of dmps every day and i see a lot of like d d just the name of a data set where no other explanation is there as if i'm supposed to like get into the head of that person and understand what they're talking about it's just yeah, something random. But that's actually very, very important for mm -hmm. you as well, for your for your future self to see what you were thinking in that moment and where you ended up. Because most probably not everything is going to go according to the plan. You're not going to do everything that you planned for or something. It's also not supposed to. Let's face it, it's exactly. really we don't know what we're gonna find. Exactly. It's supposed to be unpredictable. By exactly. And it is, it, it's usually said in the field, the, the mm -hmm. data management plan is a living document. You can always update it. You don't, you don't write anything on a, on stone. Mm -hmm. Everything can be uh, changed. But having done that exercise and having written them down, that Right. That's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The second thing is um, that researchers need to be very aware of the uh, of the types of data that are, that are the special types of data. Let's say that's that's called in GDPR. Mm -hmm. Are you using personal data? Um, are you uh collecting data that could be used by for military purposes later on dual use are you collecting health related data yeah are are you using uh data from a, a company a profit making company who okay gave to you the data to, for you to analyze but yeah you need to be able to um do this and not the other thing mm -hmm. are you using intellectual property data whatever you need to know what you are doing mm -hmm. and you need to be like consistent mm -hmm. throughout the dmp like not say oh yeah i will you i will collect personal data and then go and i will make everything open access at the end of the research well no it doesn't match that, that cannot happen so you need to know what you're doing and what options are available to you, which can change from university to university. Right. So that's also important. And finally, about data storage. <laughs> that's a big one for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because many researchers are like, 
I'm going to store the data on my like professional computer and it's it's accessible with a password and it's okay. Like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> Depending on what type of data you're using, right. you may need to encrypt it. Storing data on a personal computer is never a good idea. Mm. It can be stolen, can be uh, you can lose it on a train ride. Uh, a physical damage can happen to it. Mm -hmm. I would say always use uh, trustable, trustworthy cloud services. But I'm not talking about. Uh, I'm not gonna name names, but <laughs> I'm not talking about <laughs> those cloud clouds, services um, where yeah. we put our like um, personal uh, photos with our friends. No, <laughs> it has to be <laughs> approved by your university, and uh, you should be very, very careful what goes where, because at the end of the day, uh, again, from the example of personal data, you don't own that data. That's not your data. Mm. That's the data of the person who entrusted you mm. with it. So th those are the three big ones. I know yeah. I talked a lot about each one. Of them. <laughs> There's one thing that I think cannot be mentioned enough is do backups like of like as often as possible, like on a weekly basis if feasible, have have that automated. Because, uh, uh, like, I don't know how many PhD students have lost a full thesis on the, uh, you know, as they were writing it down, and then the computer crashed, and you only had this one copy on that computer, and gone. No. Like, it happens. It sounds like, oh, this will never happen to me, and then, bam, there you go. So, backup. Yeah. Indeed, essential. indeed. <laughs> backup, and uh, definitely, if your university has data stewards, data data management professionals, definitely go to them with all your questions. Mm. If you, your university doesn't have funds to pay these people, there are probably people that we call data champions in the field, They're like mm. who are researchers like you, but know a bit more about these things, they're interested in good research data management, find those people, ask them what you can do. Because like you said, that's that's the worst thing that can happen to lose an entire thesis or a mm -hmm. data set that you are um, analyzing just because it wasn't backed up. And mm -hmm. depending on the resources of your university, mm -hmm. automatic backup uh, can be offered. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the world is not an equal place where everyone has yeah. the same... But that's also Resources. something that we at Access to Perspectives can possibly um, give some guidance to if you're not sure how to go about, get in touch, and we can find a way together. And sometimes it's also a, a, a research institute or a partner institute in the same city, in the same country, sometimes in another country, which you can also work with for the storage if that's compliant with the research data management plan and the policy of the involved institution. So there's a lot of factors to consider, but there's always options. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Özgün. This was such a rich conversation. And I also love yeah. the fact that, um, that you presented yourself with the two professions that you have currently. And it's a beautiful example, like we also said in the beginning, as if we are human beings, we have several interests and um, we we acquire expertise in more than just one topic. And it's possible to live those expertises at the same time and to find a balanced way to to feel good about ourselves with the work we do. And um, yeah, and then touch base every now and again take holidays, close the day or turn turn into personal mode soon enough in the day so that we can recharge our batteries to perform well. First for ourselves, then for the others in the job. Yes, certainly. And if you don't know how to recharge your batteries, get help from a professional, that too. Yeah. I was definitely in that situation. I just what do you do to relax? I'm like, relax? 
what is that? There's no, there's no rest for the yeah. wicked. Oh yes, yeah, there must be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, Joe, I also wanted to thank you so much for uh, for giving me the space to talk about these two distinct things. And like like you said, we are human beings, and many times we are treated as if we are just this one thing professionally mm. like that oh that's what i do in life mm. no, you do a lot of things in life and uh, these things can come together there there could be some invisible links that that link to several things that you do and uh, you are also an example of that so mm. thank you for your work as well and uh, your contribution to <laughs> Open science in general, let me say that it is a loaded, loaded <laughs> term. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an exciting time. It's a challenging time. I think any time is challenging for whichever generation. We're in charge. We have the opportunity to fix a few things that we see um, fixable or, yeah. So, so yeah, I think like, let's, let's continue doing the good work and Yes. hold each other accountable and remind each other on hey we can do this much and then we have to rest and take also like to allow ourselves to enjoy the good things in life and not only obsess about the things that need fixing but there's a lot which is still going well also in academia maybe we just say that at the end of, of complaining yes. about yes it's not complaining it's just like stating some facts and then we've shared a lot of what's what's happening already what's on the way to improve the situation for many researchers like ourselves in the past and those who who we now work with today so thank you so much Asgun and welcome back anytime and thank so yeah you. um we will put your contact details in the blog post to this episode mm -hmm. um also on the podcast mm -hmm. uh, platforms you find the, them in the show notes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so you can anyone you can get in touch with us again through her her communication mm -hmm. channels you can get in touch with us on any mm -hmm. any of the questions that you, might, that you might have from this conversation and we're happy to hear from you as always certainly yeah all right. Okay. Thank you, Joe, and see you next time, hopefully. See you soon. <laughs>